Where do you go to research fashion, streetwear, watches, and shoes? For more than 15 million people every month, the answer is Hypebeast. The company, which has been around since 2005, is going public in US markets via a SPAC that will value the firm at over $500 million and inject $180 million of fresh capital onto their balance sheet. In today's video, we talk about their competition, the bull and the bear case for the equity, and the wildly impressive lineup of clients that they've already served. Stay with us. I'm Hannah, this is Aaron, and you're watching the Piper Rundown. We analyze business and culture to help you win. Today's rundown is presented by Jetstore. Jetstore has been providing affordable, reliable, and easy to manage data storage and cloud solutions to over 4,000 customers worldwide for more than 26 years. Believe it or not, that's longer than I've been alive. They can help you with all of your data storage and cloud management needs. Check them out at jetstore.com. Hypebeast has announced that they will uplist in the US markets via a SPAC that will involve raising $180 million of fresh capital and achieve a valuation north of 500 million. Not too shabby for an online fashion and style platform founded in Hong Kong in 2005 as a sneaker blog. The founder, Kevin Ma, with this listing will see his ownership reduced from 72 to still 40%. That's a, still a sizable chunk. Pretty darn solid. And as a part of this SPAC, a $13 million pipe, which is a private investment into this entity before it's publicly traded, will be completed by some pretty big names. Naomi Osaka, Tom Brady, actor Jonah Hill, Sheesh. Tony Hawk, and Kevin Durant. Wow, that's a stacked roster there. Since starting as a sneaker blog, they have expanded, as they say, into a platform focused on the cutting edge or the bleeding edge of a number of different arenas. And they have three divisions to their business. The first, the biggest, the kind of foundation for everything that they're doing is Hype Media. That is their media business where they sell different sponsorships. They have some really impressive partners, Jordan Brand, Red Bull, Louboutin, Ikea, Canon, Porsche, Ubisoft, and Hennessy, just to name a few. What? Wow, I'm impressed. In conjunction with that, and this is a very common part of the business model for these, what you would call subscale media companies. The second part of their business is Hype Maker, which is an in-house media agency that basically says to those brands, hey, in addition to paying for distribution, we integrate your brand into some of the media that we're making, we will help to produce that media because we understand the voice of Hypebeast and the way that our media is consumed. And instead of having this agency over here that doesn't have as much context on our audience produce that uh, advertising, we will produce it on your behalf or in conjunction with your other marketing leaders so that it has the highest likelihood of success. A lot of the highly funded media businesses of the last decade or so mm -hmm. have gone that route to try and capture more of the revenue for the business. Yeah, man, I don't want to step on the comps here, Aaron, but I'm getting strong barstool vibes. Very much so. Um, the last part of their business is HBX, which is an omni-channel shopping experience that currently only accounts for uh, less than 30% of the overall business. But if you think about them, not only as the recommender of golf apparel, watches, shoes, and all these other kind of luxury goods that they're known for recommending, then their ability to actually take a part of the transaction by handling the fulfillment and handling the sale because someone has a hype beast account or the ability to be a part of that transaction actually pushes them in the direction of going content to commerce, unlike some of the other platforms that we're gonna talk about in the comp section that have started as the transaction point and are trying to move back into content around the things that they are selling. Well, I'm intrigued, Darren. I'm sure you have some numbies for us. We talked in the last video about how IPOs were down compared to last year. SPACs are in a similar boat. Last year, there were $231 billion worth of SPAC transactions closed in just the first quarter, whereas the first quarter of 2022 has seen only 35 billion. Wow. I remember that time too. We It felt like we were dropping rundowns every single day. And yeah, it's been, uh, 
definitely slowing down. It's bananas. Uh, their revenue is climbing. They went did $85 million a fiscal year ago, and their most current fiscal year, which just closed in March, they're slightly off the regular calendar, $112 million worth of revenue projected, a 29% growth for the brand, and importantly, $9.1 million worth of profit. So unlike many of these media businesses, that were highly reliant on outside capital to grow. This is a company that has been around for closer to 20 years than 10 years yeah. and has had to operate with an eye towards profitability that some of these other brands haven't necessarily prioritized. So that uh, what allows them to do that over 10 million uh, Instagram followers on their biggest account, over 17 million across all their Instagram accounts. They have subdomains, Hype Beast Golf, Hype, mm -hmm. Hype Beast Watches. Twitter, just shy of a million followers, wow. and 15.6 million visitors to their website on a monthly basis. Damn, impressive numbers there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the comp section where we discuss the comparable companies and competitors in the space. You're exactly right to point out Barstool, and they have gone from content to commerce in the case of getting people to download their gambling app and start gambling through them, whereas players like DraftKings or FanDuel have gone the opposite route. They build the platform first, they do all sorts of advertising, and then a company like FanDuel does a deal with Bill Simmons or Pat McAfee to be their exclusive partner and draft off of the content that they produce. So in the world of fashion style, sneakerheads, uh, two of the big companies are StockX and Goat. StockX in April of 21 did a round of funding that valued the company at 2.8 billion. And Goat, which acquired another platform, Flight Club, focused on the transactions and the bidding on these type of goods, was valued shortly after that StockX round at $3.7 billion in June of 2021. So both of those companies are more the DraftKings and the FanDuels, yeah. whereas Hypebeast is trying to do more of the Barstool model yeah. without necessarily getting acquired by one of these platforms sure. and actually doing it themselves. The other company that I wanna to talk to, which we covered in a past video and I was relatively bullish on, is actually down 55% since its IPO is NerdWallet. Oh. NerdWallet is another somewhat niche and particularly not uh, uh, intuitively going to be enormous when it was founded back in the 2000s when the internet was still kind of in that nascent or recovery post dot com bubble stage and has come to the public markets without the same type of outside capital being poured in but the ability to operate a subscale media company use that term again profitably. Mm -hmm. They're at an $843 million market cap. So they really feel like a similar type of bet to Hypebeast. Now it, with NerdWallet, you're betting more on personal finance, obviously more with uh, fashion and style and sneaker culture for a company like Hypebeast. But both of them started as blogs, have built out step by step, and now have unparalleled SEO and unparalleled audience loyalty, likely because of how long they've been in the game. Yeah. Pretty impressive to build a brand like that. All right. All right, on to the meme factor where Aaron and I discuss the meme ability of a company on a scale from one to five. One is the negative memes, three is completely neutral, and five are all the positive dank memes. It doesn't really get more memeable than Hypebeast. I mean, great name, solid brand loyalty. They build a name up for themselves. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going 4.6 on this, yeah. I would give it a 4.4. .4. I think that you have a community that is going to see, you know, the sneakers or the gear that they're buying uh -huh. as an investment. So yeah. they're already predisposed to that. And I, I don't, I'm not in that culture as much. So I know, I don't know if they're exactly the same as stoolies for Barstool, sure. yeah. but there is a degree to which when you've been serving an audience so well for so long and they believe it, they love it, mm -hmm. then their ability to play a greater role in your story. You don't need everyone to buy that. Right. You just need the right niche community. And it seems like they would have the ability to do that. So I, I agree, a lot of hype on this one. All right, before we move on to the bull and the bear case, let's hear about our sponsor, JetStore, one final time. JetStore offers storage systems for private cloud hosting, video surveillance, internet of things, AI, machine learning, edge computing, data archiving, HPC, media production, medical imaging, and even flight simulations. For more details, visit JetStore.com. On to the bull and the bear case. <laughs> We start with the same bull case that I had for NerdWallet. We've got a established media business with a long-standing loyal audience that's not relying on you know crazy headlines to get clicks. They have people that have made it part of their routine to use Hype Beast when they're evaluating a purchase, and they're able to do that profitably. 
If you buy the story that this retail segment could grow to more than 50% of their revenue with an already strong standing media business, two things occur. Number one, revenue does go up. But importantly, when you look at all the very biggest companies, they are often retailers. Retailers get a different multiple, a different valuation than a classic media business. Mm -hmm. Media businesses, particularly in a world of Facebooks and YouTubes, struggle for those crazy multiples down the line. Mm -hmm. And so if they're able to already operate that business profitably and they have this other segment that can grow into something bigger, um, it, it's hard not to get bullish on what the potential is there. For sure. On the bear side, I think you really have to look at the overall growth of sneaker culture and the likelihood of that to persist. So we've done all sorts of videos on this channel in the past, both interviews with like Alto IRA uh, founder Eric Satz or other rundowns like this, where we have discussed where a low interest rate environment pushes people out onto the risk curve. When you're not getting much in the way of bonds, you're gonna seek yield, you're gonna seek returns in all these other domains outside of the conventional bonds and stocks portfolio. And there is a reasonable argument to be made that the explosion in uh, luxury good investing or sneaker culture as a, a flipping mechanism mm -hmm. is to some degree a byproduct of the insanely low interest rate environment that we have been living in for the recent period of time. So if you were looking for a bear case, I would basically point to if inflation is rising and therefore interest rates are going to rise in the future, you are being put in a position where that return that you would need to make on those sneakers is really going to have to be strong to be a sustainable investing endeavor. I don't think it goes away. I don't think it goes by the wayside, but the capacity for it to grow and for more people to be into that space specifically, I think there's some reasonable skepticism there. Fair enough. All right. That's a rundown. Thank you for watching. If you have stayed with us this long, please smoosh the like button. It really helps us out and we'll catch you in the next one.